You don't gotta. You don't have to clap. Hi. What's up? So I'm everybody? gonna pass the mic around for anyone who has questions. Uh, thanks for coming. I know it's kind of weird. We just blasted at you about it, but uh, yeah, we, this can be pretty informal. If you guys would just want to ask whatever, I'll try to answer whatever. Yeah. So thank you very much for inviting us. It's like a dream come true for all of us too. Cool. cool. So the first question is kind of obvious that sound, sonic wise, it's radically changed. It's almost like inventing new new way to make music. It's same thing. The title itself is like a new way to spell words. Mm -hmm. So maybe some connection. But can you tell us the journey discovering the new sound and why it was important for you to? find new way to tell a story or your feeling? Well, you kind of said it best, is a new way to tell a story. And like the best stories are always when you can have the, suspend your disbelief uh, as much as possible. And so I guess it's just kind of, it was kind of fun to, to do that. But I, th I just felt like it's important to, to make it sound new. Uh, to, to, I, knew, I was telling Mike the other day that used to be just a G chord on a guitar for, you know, for many years, just like, oh, wow, listen to that, boom, there, then a song came. But the longer I've done it, I've, I've been become, I guess, interested in a bunch of other sounds too, so I think this time we went looking for just different kinds of sparks, and uh, then over the course of the last few years, just putting those moments together and seeing how they coexist, and how they make something new. You know, if it felt new to me, then, I don't know, that made me excited. And if yeah. you guys could say who you are, the publication you're from, too. Next right? time, next time. I forgot yeah. that. Hey, um, I'm Daniel from Spex Magazine in Germany. And um, I've heard like, it almost sounds, the record almost sounds like a, like a broken down version of Bon Iver. And um, I wondered if there was like a particular moment in making the record when you realized that you just had to go in that direction. Yeah, um, I, I heard that the uh, seventh song played second tonight. Sorry, it was on shuffle. Um, <laughs> it was on shuffle because of that sweet party mix I made beforehand. <laughs> um, forgot to turn it off shuffle, sorry about that. Uh, but the moment for me, uh, was when I was making the second song, the song that was supposed to come directly second. And that's actually been quite around quite a long time. Um, it, was, it was called, it's called De 10 Death Breasts now, but uh, it was called Lester Check for a long time after our, our friend Ben Lester kind of helped us make it, uh, that song. But we had it on, we had it very early on. Me and BJ Burton had this drum loop and it just sounded broken down, like you said, and uh, messed up a little bit and you know personally what I was going through and just what I found other people are going through is like a lot of anxiety and, and things like that and that for me got me up out of my seat and made me want to break break it down um, and crush something or do something as aggressive sounding so uh, that when I had that going on it was kind of almost finished basically right when we made it so we had to kind of sit on it for three years or whatever it's been uh, but that kind of is like a, a song, that, a caveat, I guess, if you will, that I wanted to build around. And that was like, all right, this is, sounds like breaking open a new fabric or something. So, excuse me. Um, I think that was the, that was the moment I knew, I knew where I kind of needed to go. Yeah, I'm Tom from uh, Magazine Mike. Um, and I guess building off of you know the kind of personal story behind, there was a there was a passage in um, this little essay that uh, was Trevor Hagen wrote. Trevor, yeah. Yeah, um, which I thought was great. But I mean, in one of the parts, he says that um, on a misguided solo trip to an island off the coast of Greece, uh, you recorded that first line of the album. Uh, I wanted to know if you were willing to kind of detail that. Tell sure. Story. Yeah. Don't go to the Greek islands off season by yourself. Ugh. <laughs> oh. It was actually kind of a very bad time. Um, I was trying to find myself. Uh, I did not. Uh, but I did find that I was incredibly bored and kind of panicking a lot, walking around this town for like a week in the middle of the ocean. And uh, 
I was just kind of wrestling with the fact that I felt really poor at that, at that time. And uh, just kind of got back to my room and just, or I was kind of humming out on the way home, like, it might be over soon, like, if this feeling might be over. And uh, so I just got back and sang just some improvisation into a little sampler called the OP1, which I used a lot to make the album. And uh, it just chops up, you, ch you can chop up what it is. And I don't know, I, I, when you chop up part of the sample, it sounded like you're, it was two, two. And so I was like, 22 is my favorite number. And uh, I always thought that it reminded me of a duality, like a paradox, like an, and like a coin has two sides kind of thing. Yeah, just a, du a duality in general. And uh, I thought that it might be over soon is kind of a, a perfect kind of conjecture to that idea that, oh man, it might be over soon. Like, oh no, I want it to last forever. Or it, like, it might be over soon, thank you, God. Uh, I really don't want to feel this way anymore. Um, so that, that was kind of the beginning of that. And it really was like still months until I had any other song ideas. So it was like really annoying to have to listen to those 11 seconds of sampled music for that amount of time. But then I, that's when I kind of figured out that it was like about the album was gonna be numbers and 22 is my thing. And yeah, it kind of grew from there. Hey, Justin, hey. Uh, my name's Al from Fact in London. Hey, Al. Thanks for having me over. Yeah, man. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, it really feels like the, this record isn't just a set of songs written then recorded. It feels like uh, production's a big part of the actual songwriting this time around. And I wondered whether that was like, whether you changed up your process to do that, whether um, kind of computers and electronics were brought in to the songwriting at an earlier stage, or whether it just kind of sounds like that. Yeah, I, th I think it mostly had to do with this, this instrument, the OP-1. Um, it's the way that it sampled things, it's basically like a Casio SK-1 meets like a little miniature MPC beat maker, you know, so it, it, you can just kind of be sitting around anywhere and sample the radio or your breathing or something and, and you can make a song out of it. And so I think a lot of, a lot of moments on the record came from using that particular instrument. And uh, it, it just, it, once I had enough of that going on, that it, was, it wasn't seeming really obvious to me to pick up the acoustic guitar as often. Um, and I just wanted to kind of keep a new language going. It was kind of not as fun or as easy, but uh, it took a longer time than maybe I would have liked. Um, but the, yeah, that instrument particularly, and then just a lot of other hooking different tools up in the studio electronically, try to mess things up, or like I said, uh, a lot of um, sessions of improvisation with whoever I wanted to bring in to, to make music with, and then we might take a bit of that and sample that. And so yeah, lots of different things happen. Hi Justin, my name is Matt. I am uh, from the Stout Tony at the University of Wisconsin Stout. Um, hey Matt. I attended the Eau Claire Festival and noticed before the concert you had uh, a series of cryptic symbols displayed on those vertical screens. And in a similar fashion, the album's track list and the, and the cover itself seem to possess the same kind of cryptic quality. And I'm wondering as a whole, what is this aesthetic supposed to represent? Is it, is it some sort of cognitive dissonance or like a tumultuous self-discovery process? <laughs> wow, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, holy shit. Um, it, well, to, to, uh, you, you said it very well. Matt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you said it very well. Um, but it's not, I, I guess, I mean, that, this sounds like a lie, it probably is, but it's not supposed to be anything except for I just really love, uh, we're, deal we're dealing with some sort of religious or at least uh, spiritual iconographic sort of themes on the record and numbers in general. And so talking to Eric, Timothy Carlson, the artist, you know, we, we talked together for the last couple years about all this. And, um, it just, I just sort of let him run wild and he'd just come and draw. And I'd be like, what is that? Let's put that in there. You know, like that is absolutely emblematic of what we're, we're going for, and Eric's just such a great guy. He's the, he made the Gangs logo as well for that band that we had for a while, and just nice to have a symbol. So we we're just like, let's have a shitload of symbols. That'd be great. Um, but yeah, those those symbols before the fest were all the, the songs and stuff, and the song titles, and yeah, it's just kind of fun to look on the back of the album, not see like, 
I went down the road and then Mother's Blues or whatever. It's just a bunch of weird graveyard symbols or whatever. Awesome. Simple enough. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. Sorry about that. Uh, Carl from uh, the Tech Alert. We're yes. a major publication, I promise. <laughs> hey, Carl. Um, you know, my question is, you know, it's easy to see here that this album is kind of, you know, showing a transcendence from the past to the present to the future. I'm seeing a lot of parallels to what your hope is for the Eau Claire area, northwestern Wisconsin. You work with the Confluence Project. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit, kind of what you hope for this area? Is it going to kind of mirror your album in a way? Yeah, I mean, they put, they put up that mural over here, which I think is so exciting. I, like, I'm, just so, I'm pumped about that in a, maybe just a totally selfish way. Uh, but I, I think with, with the festival and the hotel and, and stuff, I, I don't know. You go around the world and you see a bunch of really great places and I just know this place so well. And every place should, I don't know, take care of itself or something. And, you know, most of the stuff that we do is just for cultural stuff, you know, music and art and expression. And there's a lot of really more, more important work out there in our, in your and I's community up here in Northwestern Wisconsin. And, but uh, it just feels really good to have that be part of your job, to, to be part of the thing, the apparatus, like the mirror of our little culture here. Um, and just trying to make everyone feel better or like they have an option. And a great way to do that is with art and experience and give people a reason to hoot and holler and, and, and do that stuff. And you know, I was driving uh, down here and I saw like a new Eau Claire sign over by the new kind of Altoona development uh, coming in down Galloway or something over there by the new Woodman's grocery store. And it just, it was a kind of a bad sign. I want to, I want to talk to somebody about that sign, Nick Meyer. Um, I just wanted it to be like, it should be like lit up cooler. And like, or like something should be bigger or like weirder saying like, we live here, not just like, we also live in America, too, you know? And, and, and I just think that I'm not, definitely not mad at anybody, you know? Uh, me and Mike Perry talk a lot about what it's like to be, you know, like his, he always talks about his brothers, the loggers. They're just dudes that are logging and we just write words down on paper, you know, it feels kind of weird sometimes. Uh, but that, that is what we do, and it just seems so obvious to us that we're supposed to do that. And it's just, it's, there's a lot of people here fighting that fight, I guess. If it needs to be a fight, I guess it does, but yeah. Hey, Justin. My name is also Justin. Yes. Uh, I'm from 88.9 Radio Milwaukee. Um, oh, awesome. I've been to Eau Claire's the past two years, and it has been like an absolute riot. It's cool. awesome. And, uh, um, and like the whole, I, I remember after the, uh, the second night on the first year, I was like, dude, I'm just happy for Justin. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, I'm just like pumped for, I was just like happy for you and happy about the whole thing. I thought mm -hmm. it was just like fucking great. And uh, um, I was wondering what that kind of whole energy has had on, uh, on this album. Yeah, well on this album, it was a totally different energy, not pumped for Justin's. Yes. kind of energy for a while. Um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, we, we did the first couple albums, you know, and then things just kind of got a little big, real, like kind of real quick. Even though it was taking years, it was just a little strange. So I kind of had to back off because it just, it felt odd, it didn't match up or something. And uh, yeah, I, I think like last year Bon Iver played and that was just kind of like us shaking the dust off and this year to have a reason, you know, it felt really good to, you know, to, to play the album and have that kind of be a strange happening and so I feel a lot better now, now that it's done. Um, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really fun for a while, you know, I, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit tonight, but I just really don't do well, and this is part of the reason we wanted to do something like this, and whoever wanted to come, we'd be really, really deeply thankful for, but, you know, sitting in a room and talking to, to journalists for so many, like, weeks on end throughout the years, it, it's, it's just didn't work for me, and, and I couldn't hear myself talk that much about something like a music song, you know, there's so many things going on in the world, and this is, these are just the music songs I made, why do we have to talk about it too a bunch of times? 
Um, and so it took me a long time, I think, to honestly to shake a lot of that off. And I, I didn't get it all off at all. You know, I'm still kind of just nervous. I'm really nervous tonight, you know. Uh, and, and I was nervous at the fest, you know, just like a lot of folks and a lot of people telling me thank you. And, and, and it's not quite right or something. It doesn't, it doesn't all add up like that, like coming at me. Um, but it's fun to do stuff with the opportunities you're given. And this is like a good example of that, I guess. Hey, hey. Uh, my name is Rune. I'm from uh, Gaffer Magazine, Scandinavia, hey, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so as you know, up there it's all dark and we're all depressed and all those kind of things. Um, <laughs> and uh, goes without saying, you've been a huge hit up there. <laughs> cool. <laughs> So I guess I have to ask the question, why the more like electronic kind of um, way you go now? Like you could have made like a country record like Neil Young after, uh -huh. after the Gold Rush when he went in and made a country record. You could have made like a Miles Davis kind of blue record. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose to go this way? I think I have, I've really- I have to ask that on behalf of the Scandinavian people because yes. they will ask me that question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, I think it's that thing of wanting to bash things apart a little bit and, and to break through some stuff. And uh, I needed it to sound a little radical for me to feel good, I guess, about make, putting something out in the world. Like, cause for me, I, I think it's not embarrassing, but the, the old records are of this like kind of sad nature, you know. And I was going, you know, that, I was healing myself through that stuff. And being sad about something is okay. And then being like wallowing and then circling the same cycles emotionally is, just feels boring, I guess, a bit. And for this one, there's, there's still some dark stuff and whatever, but I think, I think cracking things and making things that are bombastic and kind of exciting and, and also new and mash, mashing things together and explosiveness and kind of shouting more. I think that was more of the zone, you know? I think shouting, it's like whispering was the thing maybe before and maybe next record there'll be a lot more like <laughs> Or like, that, that, yeah, it's like maybe we'll do some black metal shit from up your way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Believe you me, I've tried to hand the keys over to Sean Carey to lead sing this band uh, multiple times. <laughs> Hi, Justin. Alex from War Magazine in Mexico. Hey, Alex. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Uh, well, we are here, you know, Claire, in your hometown. I want to know how was it for you to grow up in a place like this? I mean, the city is amazing. The lakes, the parks are beautiful. I went out and, and met a lot of places today. And I want to know how was it and which was the involvement of, of this amazing place in this particular album? Uh, and where exactly did you uh, work with the album? Where's the studio now that we are mm -hmm. here? Yeah, well, I did. We actually did a lot of work um, here uh, in Eau Claire, is where our studio is outside of the town. And uh, but I, we did a bit of traveling too. Like I was in London for a little bit, and um, we were in outside of Lisbon for like six weeks. Me and Chris Messina and PJ Burton were just out there trying to work on things. <laughs> <laughs> trying really hard to work on things and uh, but so I, I was trying to maybe not be here so much because I have been here so much and uh, you know out at the, uh, the studio we call it April Base there's a lot of activity out there and we we're trying to do something kind of I don't know ha have more people use the space so it's not just like it's that one guy's house you know uh, kind of make it more of a platform for people making recordings um, and so I wanted to kind of get out of there and try some new stuff, but the bulk of the record was recorded there still, ultimately because we just have all our tools there and we really can like hone in on it. I think the only problem was that I was living there the whole time, the last eight years. Um, finally got out of there. Um, but living, living in Eau Claire and growing up here is, I think the easiest way to say is that it was easy. Um, I had extremely supportive parents. Um, extremely safe, extremely good schools. Like when I was in high school, and it's changed a lot now, we had like an immense like arts program. Like my music program was just absolutely 
insane, which worked out really great for me. And in general, I feel like there's people that say they weren't born in the right place, and I was just born into just the easiest situation and, and, and uh, had so many good experiences, and I feel like I was lucky enough to, to be fortunate enough to get the most out of that upbringing. Um, looking back on it now, you, you realize some of the things that you miss out on by being in a city like this, you know? I don't, I don't think I had like a black friend until I was a 16. You know, and that it's that's not like bad or something. I just didn't meet any of them. I didn't have a black friend, you know. And so that just goes to to show you that like there's uh, there's walls too, and I, you know the, the walls that kind of protect you, and the walls that also keep other things out. That you know. But I think I try to keep a lot of perspective as as you grow as I grow up and as I grow up as I get older and, and to understand that. And now we've gone around the world and seen a lot of things and um, I'm just older so I understand more about how the world actually is now. But I think f for me, it's kind of weird knowing that there's a platform, there's enough people out there that want to hear my music. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, I guess that was the point, that was the whole idea growing up. It's like, yeah, you make music and then there's many people to hear it. It was like, it's almost too many people. But I think given the opportunity, I just wanted to make something exciting. You know, I think about the albums that, uh, that, that was for the world, not just Eau Claire, I guess. And the, way, the, mu the, musics that ex the musics that are exciting to me, the albums are always ones that stand alone or something. And so I just really tried to work for a long time to make it stand alone. And, Eau Claire is a place that kind of stands alone, but it's very the same too in certain ways as other places. And uh, I think for me, you know, I shout out Eau Claire in a lot of ways, like the song 715 is our area code. And, but it's also, I think, a bridge for me from Eau Claire to understanding the rest of the, the world. And not to keep rambling, but that's kind of the whole album too. Like 22 being my favorite number is the beginning and millions the end. And millions just kind of the other like everyone else, the impossible to understand category, you know, of like who can actually paint a million dots? Well, Timothy Myers can this artist in New York, but who can actually, who can, who can like quantify or like how many people are in here? We, you can't even like figure that out very easily, you know? It's a lot of things to understand. There's 27. 27, <laughs> okay. That's a good number. Uh, hi, Justin. Uh, thanks for having us out. I'm Jacob from KEXP in Seattle. Oh, awesome. Thanks for coming. Oh, uh, thanks for having me. I was standing next to that really cool mural earlier today, and I looked to my left, and I realized that one of the, like, the smaller paintings within the larger painting is like six dudes being crucified. And I kind of looked around the mural a little bit more, and I saw 777, 666, another couple Christ-like figures, and I went back and listened to the album this afternoon and right now, and I'm, I'm seeing a ton of religious imagery in it. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, was there a religious uh, or spiritual kind of influence or those concepts you were thinking about while you were making this album or while you were going through the last couple years? Sure. Yeah, I mean, growing up here, like I got confirmed. I don't know if anybody else got confirmed. I guess you can't take that away. That's what it is. Um, yeah, confirmation. You know, it's funny. But I grew up here like with that. And uh, I studied religious studies at Eau Claire here and I've always just liked to think about what makes people tick. So I was in, when I was in, being confirmed and I was like, yes, Jesus is, is the, my Lord and Savior. Um, I was into that idea. Like I was into the fact that there was a day of the week that uh, I got to just sit down and be like, all right, what is my soul or something, you know? Um, and, but I think throughout time, um, and my, we'd have healthy conversations about it in my household. You know, my dad wouldn't go to church. My mom would talk about why it's just kind of good to go, you know. But, uh, but then we just stopped going at a certain point. And then studying religion in college, for me, I thought it was so vital to understand people. And to, to religion's doing lots of good, you know, all over the world. But for me, uh, I don't know, I just hadn't got to make like kind of like a naughty record yet. And... Uh, <laughs> I do think that there's a lot of benefit for talking about the deconstruction of religion or, or what, what things could be better without having to hold on to those things. Um, 
But if I can kind of shout out Eric, the, the artist, I think one of the things he did beautifully in that lower left-hand corner of the album is there's like a turkey leg looking symbol, which is, which is part of an upside down cross. And then that sort of is also just the inside of a peace symbol. And then there's the two people having sex that look like a peace symbol. And then there's the crucifixes on a road, which came from a mushroom trip of mine. I thought, I thought all the electronic uh, wires were crucifixes, because that's how they used to be on the roads into Rome. They'd all be lined with crucifixes, which is lots of people got crucified, not just three folks on one day. Um, I, I just think I like pointing at that stuff and, and knowing that it's really powerful imagery, and it's, but that, again, going back to what Eric was doing, he made this deconstruction of a mushroom trip and a peace sign and, and made it an upside down cross. But if you look at the people getting crucified upside down, they're like very peaceful, like just kind of objective humans. And they look kind of peaceful and that same shape kind of happens other places on, in the artwork. And it's, it's more about just like a, a heralding kind of position. And so I really liked to think, you know, my favorite piece is definitely the sex symbol, sex peace symbol. It, it's like people loving each other, doing, sacred things like is what makes the world go and if truly loving and taking care of each other in familial sense and like just in a community that stuff's very very powerful and i think that there's a way to do that without without uh being like guilty and, and having a lot of uh i don't know those old constructs hanging around too much but Hey, how you doing? Hey. Uh, uh, I'm Dan Wilcox from KCRW, and uh, Amazing. I um, grew up here. I was born here. Oh, wow. Went to Eau Claire Memorial. What so, year did um, you graduate? 91. My sister was 91. I, I, I went to jazz camp with your sister. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing myself a lot of favors by announcing I went to <laughs> This is great news. Jazz camp, but, oh. but yeah, I know Kim. Yeah. The, yeah, um, the whole thing. We have a lot of friends in common. We've never met, but... Um, oh, cool. But anyway, I wanted to... There, a few people have touched upon this question, but I wanted to maybe ask it in a different way. Um, there, there seems to be a lot of desire um, for you to want to... You know, between the studio that you've created and the Eau Claire's Festival and, you know, maybe this hotel and even this specific event here to want to share Eau Claire with people outside of, of this place. Mm -hmm. uh, why, I'm, I'm just curious why, why that is, why, why is that uh, such a kind of a seemingly sort of a strong desire for, for you and what are some of the rea different reactions that you've had from people that have come here um, who've never experienced either Eau Claire or Wisconsin before? Well, everyone that comes from the festival, and they actually come from a lot of places. It's really exciting. Um, but I think, I think I've, I've thought about that, you know, and I actually had a thought that I kind of liked that was uh, may, maybe, maybe if that is a motivation of mine or subconsciously or, or whatever, I think, I, 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 I think it's just as nice to think about the folks that are just from here to have other folks come here and, and to just like, oh, you're different, oh, you know, this is great. You guys like it here? You guys are here for the festival? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good here. You know, that's why we live here. And uh, I think that that's really exciting too. It's like almost sharing what we have here and what who we are here with, with everybody else um, as much as it is sharing Eau Claire with those folks, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting. I don't know what the percentage is of, of folks that come to the festival from Eau Claire, but it's not like a very large portion, you know? And I think, I like thinking that Eau Claire is going to be around a lot, for a long time and that, that that number will just grow because I just, I think it's really fun. And I wish, I wish, wish, wish I had something like that to go to when I was young. So that's, that's the thing is that it's, I think it's a bit of both. Soda cities, we got to get more people to Soda City Days in Chippewa Falls, exactly. <laughs> Soda City Days in Eau Claire. 
that. What? That's in Eau Claire. Oh, well, in the, in, it's on the mural in Chippewa on the way up to the East Hill, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> Gramercy, sure. Pure Water Days, thank you. Gosh. Wow, embarrassing. Don't let anybody also, know. not Pure Water Days anymore. It's, yeah, it stopped. It's called Heritage Fest. Hairdo? Heritage. Oh. Hey, Justin, this is uh, Steve Hyden from hey, Up Rocks. Steve. We've talked a couple times. Um, yeah. Last time I interviewed you, it was last summer. And at that, t at that time, you were still unsure about Bonnie Bear's future. You weren't sure when you were going to be doing a new record. And you seemed pretty burned out at that time with the business and everything that, you know, the sort of fame cycle that the band had been through. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, like, what changed for you? And is, has anything changed? Like, obviously, you've done this event to promote the record. Do you plan to do anything else different in terms of the band, in terms of touring or promotion or TV or anything like that moving good, forward? Very good question. I love talking to you. I said a lot of things that were very freeing to say to you after a very long time. Um, I think one thing is, is that when you go on tour, like every friend that I have that gets a record deal and, and gets to go out on tour, they just go and we went. And, um, and almo almost all of them hit a wall of some kind or another. Um, and it's not even a bad thing. Like people make runs and, and it's an amazing experience and it's not a bad thing necessarily. Uh, like I don't regret anything that really we've done because I didn't know what I knew at, you know, before that. But something we're going to do different now, I think, is just, well, like this, like, yeah, like you said, this is a, a better thing for me, even though I'm super nervous still. It's getting better. It's getting better. Um, but, you know, I think how you schedule a tour, and it's like, well, let's do that. And we got to go to, we have to go to Pittsburgh and D.C. and Cleveland. And it's really, really hard to quantify it like that. You can't just go and be everywhere. And, and to be in demand is a wonderful thing. But if you just go, it's a wonderful thing because it means you get to do what you love for a long time, uh, many times. Uh, but if you just go and you're not replenishing yourself with reasons to make music or you're not necessarily figuring out ways to change the music you have. Like Bon Iver went on tour with like less than 10 songs for like a long time. <laughs> and, and we did a good job, you know, and it was really fun and we had the best of times. Uh, but you, you burn out on that. And I think with Eau Claire and you know, this Michelberger thing that some of my friends are doing in Berlin um, soon, it, it's really just like, hey, why don't we just take a minute and, oh, sorry, another thing was the Austria, we went to Sydney Opera House and did these circle shows. It was really special. It's like made you just think. So a combination of, of that and and all these kind of the shows. We played a sunrise show in L.A. Sorry, I'm rambling a bit. Uh, you just realize that every concert should be special. Like it doesn't necessarily have to just be a concert with a ticket price on it. And it's like it it should be something that means something, or you should be there for some kind of reason. And not that playing your fifth show in Chicago in less than a year and a half uh, is bad for those folks. I think we, we played good shows and people got a lot out of it, but you can only hear like, that was the greatest show before you're not, you're just not engaged. You do not want to not be engaged. To, to get off, this is a bit embarrassing, but I got off stage once at Bonnaroo, I think the first time we played. I'm not, a, I'm not totally crying all the time. I'm like, I'm, I'm somewhat sensitive, but I'm not a huge crier got off stage and it was a great show. Like we thrashed it. I think Sean broke a bunch of drums. And it was so good. Like it was such a good feeling and I just was so not there. I had to go so far in a, in a weird direction to be there properly. And it's, it's a very sensitive thing to say, but it's true. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just think as we look forward, we really wanna just try to make every concert experience or if we're going to play music let's have it mean something we put together a set of our, our gear that just like packs away into smaller cases they become pretty large actually but that we can go and play kind of anywhere with like a generator or something if, just, if we're out on tour and you you know you're playing the Enormo Dome again not that we're that big but you're probably playing the Enormo Dome in Boston or whatever um, it it doesn't you need to counteract that with something. You need to get up in somebody's face and play music with them around you and stuff. And 
uh, it's just good to take that, take moments to remember that and to, to not be in a hurry. Because when you're in the middle of a tour, you cannot change your future that easily. You're really in it. You're really in that forward motion. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for having us here. It's an honor to be here and listen to your story, and especially this album. I was also at Eau Claire Music Festival, and it was something I can't even explain. Cool. That's good. <laughs> but um, you and I, I read in here that your friend Trevor Hagen, he had reflected on saying that this album is made up of moments. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to know what it felt like in the moment of discovering that this album was going to be something that you, unlike anything that you've ever done before, something so different, but something that you knew was gonna be something, um, that you knew was reflecting everything that you could put into music. It's a, it's a good question. I think what, what's strange is that now, you know, the album's just 30, 39 minutes, you know, and so, you know, it's kind of like one, long moment but you know the last few years it's, you know I can't really look back and be like oh remember all those years and like there's this moment this moment and this moment there are all these like moments that that add up to one moment and you know I used to feel like when I was younger I would get that sort of aha moment like oh this is everything I live for I just made this song and it works really good this one was so much more of like a I don't know like a chainsaw sculpture or something like a metaphor for something Wisconsin-y around here, but like really having to chip away and add pieces and um, taking literally moments, like you said, out of an improvisation or something. Um, uh, in Portugal, I had my friend Trevor who wrote the essay just in, take his shirt off and play a bunch of free jazz trumpet on all the songs. You know, those are a bunch of moments. But you take, a, <laughs> uh, but you take, you take those, and uh, I think that is what's kind of beautiful about it. As you, it, that, that was fun about it, and it was interesting to me enough to make it, uh, taking those moments and kind of superimposing them and seeing what kind of thing you can get. But I think to further answer your question, uh, I'm realizing that you don't have as many of those moments uh, as you grow older that you have when you're young, because everything when you're young is so huge and so bountiful and so kind of endless. And as you get older, not that it's like dire, but I think you start to realize that, that time and, and all these moments are really kind of part of a longer moment. And so for me, I think um, the last few years has just been one long moment. I had, I had a lot of moments where I was like, yes, got that, got that song done, or like something really good is happening. But I don't think I ever felt like it was done until it was done. And it was always kind of scary until I, until I couldn't, until I finished it, you know? And I almost did actually quit on it, not in like a sad way, but like six months, uh, probably January this year, I, I kind of like, kind of hung it up, hung, on this, hung the album up, because it's just become kind of convoluted. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's very dense and just sort of tired of it and tired of myself and like, why are you trying so hard? And my friend Ryan Olson just like kind of slapped me. He was like, uh-huh. And he just basically sat next to me and like virtually held my hand through the entire process of finishing the album. And to me, personally, that's my favorite part of it, of the album. It was like that moment, the last six months of him just coming and picking his friend up, you know. So, moments. <laughs> Hi, Justin. My name is Sammy West. I'm from The Spectator, UW-Eau Claire's newspaper. Hey. Um, so I was just wondering, you kind of talked about this before, but I was wondering how your time at UW-Eau Claire impacted, I guess, your life and your journey as a musician in this album. Um, my uh, advisor was Dr. Charlene Burns, and she's still kicking it over there. And um, she, so formative to me, just having a good teacher, somebody who cares about me, she knew she would really rip up my grammar and my, my philosophy papers, but she was like, it's a C minus, but you're my favorite guy to talk to in class, you know, <laughs> or second favorite or whatever. Um, and I've had good conversations with, you know, working on the confluence and stuff. I, I know Kim Way and a lot of people dealing with the university and, and the way the university is kind of changing into uh, community outreach, how 
where the, the university is reaching out into the community rather than putting up those walls. Um, I had a lot of good conversations about just the value of the liberal education. You know, I think it's interesting to, to both see how the university has to become more of a business in this world, which, you know, is it's actually kind of helpful because it's, at least it's playing by the rules, but it's unfortunate how it, you know, hurts the students. But I think it's, I think it's just valuable to have people that are just deciding, I'm gonna learn for four years, and these other people are like, I'm gonna teach for 40 years. Uh, that is just a, a beautiful thing. And so for me, I was lucky enough to have a pretty low tuition and just go and learn about people for four years. And it absolutely is you know, in my fabric as a person. And so many people talk about that. You know, I think you actually need a degree less these days to actually be in the world, but having a degree means you decided to do something for yourself and therefore make your people around you better. If that answers it a little bit, maybe. Hi, my name is Laura and I am from USA Today Network Wisconsin and you collaborated with a lot of other artists on projects uh, in the time between your albums. Mm -hmm. How much of an effect did that have on your new album? Tons, yeah, tons. It, every, everybody, you know, I was just talking about Ryan Olson. Um, I think that a, a cool caveat or story is like after we did the Gangs album here in Eau Claire when Ryan put that whole thing together, uh, it was just the wildest amount. Thank you, brother. Yes. Um, the, you know, it's just really fun. A lot of people in a room making music. And it was around that same time that, that uh, Kanye West asked me to come out to Hawaii and like work on his stuff. And um, when, I, when I got, it was like right on the tail end of doing gangs, I went in there and I, was, I just felt like I was really ready for that in a weird way, even though it was a very, I was fish out of water a little bit. And there was a lot of hilarious things that happened uh, because I was just like, where am I? Uh, but it was just the same. It was just a bunch of people working super hard on just making a song. And uh, the, pe the people like, and I, I, the reason I like to say that story is I think about Ryan, I think about Kanye, and I think about anybody who, who's important to me musically, uh, whether I know them or not. Uh, but when you're, when you're with somebody and they, they can show you how to be yourself more. And, and, and Kanye and Ryan are both really like that. And uh, they, they just, no holds barred, they're kind and they will, know, they will tell you something can be better as well. And so there's that kind of collaboration. There's also other collaboration where you just see what kind of mayhem you can make by throwing anybody in a room together. Um, but I, I'd say to answer your question, I do think that the collaboration is more fun and, and more kind of, it lengthens you. It makes you stand up taller and makes you have to kind of prove yourself or like, I don't know. It's just, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot from it. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's fun not to just have to work on my own thing, my music. You know, it's just very valuable, I think, to just step away from that kind of stuff because um, it renew it charges the batteries. Hey, Justin, it's hey. Carmel from WFUV in New York. Hey, thanks so What's much up? for having me. Sure. Us. Um, so, talking about artists that have influenced you in the liner notes, the albums dedicated to the musics, Richard Buckner. Awesome, yeah, totally. And uh, also Bernice um, Regan, so I wanted to know if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, um, Richard Buckner and uh, Bernice Johnson Regan, uh, that I wanted to dedicate it to them for some reason. Um, I think <laughs> Richard Buckner is one of the only artists, maybe the only one that has like 13 albums and all of them are perfect. Um, you know what I'm talking about, right Graham? He's not even in here. Uh, he, 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 I think he was the first one that showed, showed me that lyrics could really be what more flowing and more impressionistic. Like I found myself falling deeper into, uh, into a land 
or, or a dream or s suspending disbelief when I heard him using his words and he'd put them out in like it'd be a novel form in his record and it was just strange and it, I just got a lot out of his writing and uh, he yeah it's just kind of endless uh, the, the way that he gave me courage to write that kind of lyrics and and to just sound things out and then find out what it means later you know um, with Bernice I cared about her music for so long. Um, you hear her singing in the, the Ken Burns Civil War uh, documentary series on PBS, and you hear her voice a lot when the music comes in. And she was able to achieve uh, sitting down and, and singing a spiritual, a black spiritual song by herself and being the choir herself. And for her, to, for her to be able to accomplish that and to be all the voices at once, um, kind of how she internalized it all and like how she got to be all those different singers. Because sometimes when you're a singer, it's like, well, I sing this way, so I better keep singing this way so that people understand that it's me, you know? Uh, for me, she was able to change her voice so radically. It's like, Mike Patton's got nothing on her. You know, not just teasing. Uh, but she was able to do so much and explain so much and her, why she's playing music. That's another thing. Why her music's important and why the songs she chose on all her records, what they were saying, you know, buses are coming. You know, like, she was dealing with very, you know, you know Christian modes and things like that, but it's all, I always found that that was such a beautiful place where pain and sorrow from from impossible and possibly hard lives uh, you found they found the joy she found the joy in those songs and she brought them to life in, in ways that I just kind of really worship so uh, that's why I wanted to shout her out Hi Justin, my name is Katie. I work with the Chippewa Herald and Chippewa Falls. Hey Katie. Um, I've been trying to phrase this question for the last hour, so it might just come out as a big ramble. <laughs> <That's cool, man. laughs> but um, so totally cool. you played all over the world. There are people from all over the world here tonight. You could have had this anywhere, and we all would have come if our papers would have paid us for it. But <laughs> um, I was sitting here during track eight, and I was looking at this deer, and I was like, this just fits. It just fits here. How do your home influences kind of continue to influence you, or do they? Is that something you're trying to get away from, or do you work with that? Good, good question. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to try too hard to do anything, um, and, and I think that's a little bit why uh, going on a press tour and like answering um, questions like that more than once are it's difficult because then you just start making shit up and then you believe yourself. <laughs> It is not a cool place to be in sometimes. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that deer actually is just something we brought from the studio because we don't have any artwork here at the hotel yet we're working on. Uh, so actually, <laughs> that deer, was, it was in our studio while we made this album, which is, it's, it was really weird actually bringing it down here. It's like, I'm gonna look at that again? I was like, this whole time, it's just sitting there in the same exact like angle that I was working on the album. Um, but you know, they want, like I, I said before tonight, like the older you get, this kind of more sure you are about some things and, and the more sure you are about being less sure about certain things. And I, I think I've become more and more aware of how minute our existences are. There's this Louis C.K. quote I've been saying a lot lately. It's great. It's, it's not your life, it's life. You know, and I think that that's really good. And Eau Claire is just this little tiny place, and to it's totally worth it to sing its praises and to sh hold up a mirror to the other folks that are living in your town with you. And it's also really good to remember that we are just, we're in a room right now talking about music. And that is both ridiculous and amazing. You know, it's so unnecessary and yet so necessary. Unnecessary in quotes and necessary period with no quotes. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, Justin. I'm Randy from the Lacrosse Tribune. Hey, Randy. Thanks for having us. Thanks all for coming here. up. Um, I have two questions. Yeah. The first one: all of the the promo pictures of you, uh, none of them really show your uh, handsome face, and um, <laughs> it's very mysterious. Is this like a, a kind of something that you're trying to cultivate a, n a new mysterious image? The other question I have is. Um, can you talk about the staves? Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, they're they're going to be coming to lacrosse, and um, I'd, I'd be excited to hear more about that. Is, is that on the ninth? Uh, eight oh. November eighth. Yeah, think. yeah, okay. Eight, nine, nine. You could come too. Yeah, I might. I might. Um, the pro yeah. The the first question is the whole the whole thing is I ha I really don't like seeing pictures of myself. I really like when you think about Pink Floyd. You don't think about what what Dickie Gilmore looks like, you know? Like, I do not care about what he looks like. I just want to listen to Pink Floyd. Um, I, I, think, I think that uh, how people look and, and how their music sounds is, is actually sometimes goes hand in hand. But I am not trying to do that. And um, it really, and I'm not like a big like, oh no, not my face. It's just like, I don't really love meeting too many people because I don't have enough time to be their friend. And, and that's the, our whole idea with it, is that uh, Cameron Wittig and Crystal Quinn, uh, we made the photos together, and it was like fun, because we were actually trying to maybe say something a little bit. Now, the problem is getting your guys' papers to run those pictures, because they're like, well, we need exclusives. So. But you know, like, the whole thing is just uh, faces are for friends only. You know, that's what I think. And, um, <laughs> The, the Staves, um, it's a great thing to talk about. You know, I worked on their album with them, me, Zach Hansen, and Chris Messina out at the house for over a year. We put a lot of time into that thing. And uh, it's just, it's just kind of crazy when, when new people come into your life and really just change your history, change your course of history. Um, and what they're able to do with their voices still just staggers me. Um, now we're all close enough friends where we can bicker and argue and things like that. Uh, but their music, that whenever they do music, it's it just puts me down, you know, and uh, not in a bad way. Like want to lay down and just go, ah, oh, you know, and and uh, yeah, to they they're taking a shot. Like they they moved out to Minneapolis and uh, just for a little bit to like just be near some Eau Claire uh, or sorry some American places to tour because they've been in England their whole lives. Um, and it's just fun, man. They practice sometimes at our place. They, uh, they're like playing with musicians from Eau Claire, and Minneapolis, and meeting people from all over the country, and making music with them in Canada. And so they're just having like this American adventure, and it's just really fun to to have that going on around here. And yeah, whoever hasn't got to hear them sing, you need to do it right away. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Justin. Hey. Uh, I'm Eric from City Pages in Minneapolis. Hey, Eric. Thanks for, um, thanks for having me. Uh, so when did you first make the decision that you were going to premiere the, the album live in its entirety at Eau Claire? And you know, what kind of challenges did you, did you find transforming those songs from the studio to you know, a big festival stage like that? Well, the first challenge, good question. The first challenge was that I just didn't really want to play the songs live. I just wanted them to play this album that we made for so many years first, you know, not something that they're not going to hear later, uh, except on YouTube and stuff. Um, there, were, there were a lot of challenges. Uh, I think when, when we decided, I guess, was uh, when, when we knew that when Eau Claire was, and I knew that I was kind of maybe going to be done with an album, it was just like, all right, that's a good goal. That's a good thing to match up. Um, and, and we didn't, we really, really went around and around, me and Kyle and the whole squad and Michael Brown, like, what, what, what should we do? How do we do this? You know, like, should we play in the morning instead? Like, should we just play the album and not, and like air guitar it? Like, we, we really like thought of a bunch of different ideas, which in hindsight, might have should have done that. Um, but I, I think it was just too good of an opportunity. And to be honest with you, it was kind of an uncomfortable one because it's just, a, it's like, kind of the opposite of what I like doing. It's, it's like Eau Claire's for me is very much not trying to, for it to be about like me and my band. It's, it's really truly about this whole other thing, this new community and all this other music. So it's kind of strange, uh, but it just seemed like too good of an idea to pass up and, and when can you do that? And it just, 
Yeah, it, it was a, a good idea, and I'm glad it's over now. <laughs> Steven from Uncut, and um, I was curious about, um, you were talking about trying to make something that sounded new, that didn't sound like anything you'd heard before. Um, and, and I guess, especially in a place as familiar as your studio, and at the time you're home, how do you sort of get out of a routine uh, of using technology the same way, of using the space the same way, to create something that's uh, new? And as a subset of that question, I heard that there was an instrument y'all invented that allowed you to play Mike Lewis playing the saxophone. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Great. I'll talk about that first. Um, the, the, uh, I have this friend, Francis Starlight, and uh, he's staying at my house for a good year. He's a really awesome musician. And uh, I saw him doing this thing. Um, with with harmon with, with harmony engine, which is a plug-in, it's a long story. Basically, saw him taking a trumpet line and like playing it, kind of. Um, he was kind of doing it after the fact. There was somebody on playing on the recording, and he would just kind of play it and made it sound like a bunch of more of those. And uh, I just was like, holy cow, you know, that is amazing. That's really that's really cool. And then I was talking with Chris Messina. Uh, the man that makes April Bass go, uh, my confidant basically this entire record process. Um, we were just talking about you know setting up new toys and trying to find new zones and doing just that, trying not to get stuck um, in any sort of technological toilet <laughs> toilet bowl <laughs> circling situation. Uh, um, and I was just you know how how in the hell could you do that at at once at one time? And uh, that was just me probably talking to him like, isn't that be cool? Let's try that out. And he's like, oh God, now I have to figure out how to do that. And he really did. And uh, one of the things that you can't do that, why, why you can't do that exactly is that uh, CPUs and stuff don't really have that capacity to do that like live, right, as it's happening. And so Chris Messina figured that out. And so when we figured it out, uh, he, he got all the gear to make it work. I was like, we're calling this the Messina. And so that's what we do now. Um, we use it a lot on a lot of stuff, and we actually use it a lot live now, too. And uh, the, the thing with Lewis, the saxophone thing, which is the second to last song with the really kind of bizarre saxophone stuff, so sounding stuff, that's me and him some morning just plugged this thing in, and I was like, why don't we just put your saxophone in it and, and see what happens? And Mike Lewis is probably my favorite living musician and he the way he plays the saxophone is it's like Bernice singing you know uh, and so he, we just played and I'm, I'm doing my clunky kind of piano chords and, and so what's on the record is just a moment just a complete improvisation of us you know making something up and I, I, I guess I could go on and on. I want to go on and on about how it actually works because it's so fun and Messina is my dude uh, but yeah that's that's how the Messina works uh, you'll have to remind me of the first part of your question, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, well, just how do you make it, uh, how, do, how do you sort of avoid any kind of routine? Oh, well that's, that's kind of it. I think that's sort of like, well, and then I did have things where we had too much routine, like Pro Tools, I don't know if anybody works on that computer program, but I wish I didn't have to work on that computer program sometimes. And, and that's like a big thing that I'd love to see different, you know, like, but Basically, you find new places, and then you end up having to stand in the same places too, sometimes. And technologically speaking, we made some discoveries, which felt good. And then, you, but you also end up just playing a guitar part sometimes too. <laughs> Thanks for coming, man. Hi, my name's Pip. Um, I'm hey, writing Pip. for the Australian Press. But I don't Thanks for coming. <laughs> I didn't come that far. I just live in New York. Oh, uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. <laughs> um, it's sort of a sentimental question. It was actually really enjoyable to just read the liner notes and listen to the album, and cool. it reminded me of being a teenager. I'm sure people have done it more recently than that, but <laughs> when we only had records. Mm -hmm. And um, I wondered what you think are the ideal conditions for listening to this album? Mm. A place... Uh, I shouldn't decide that, but a, a, a place where... Uh, you can feel al alone, um, maybe, or, or a, a moment of re reflection. 
without going too far into it, I think that Trevor writes about this really well in his essays. But um, it's a bit like about music in general is about self discovery and and self understanding. And um, I think that there's a danger to just being very reflective. Like this is my journey. Okay, this is about where I'm going. You know, like it's very dangerous to get too reflective. I think. Uh, but I do think it's fun sometimes to have a moment, you know, I guess I just can't imagine listening to this album in a room with 27 other people and having it be like, yeah, I don't know. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> but I think headphones are cool. <laughs> that'd be a good place for That'd be a good place for them. <laughs> hey again. Um, hey. You, as you mentioned, are very in demand. Um, was there a point in the making of the album where you actually had to start telling people? Sorry, no. Sorry, one second. No, not. Thanks. Sorry, go ahead, please. Was there a point making the album where you had to um, start turning down offers from other people who wanted to collaborate so you could actually knuckle down and, and finish this thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, I made that Staves album, which uh, with those guys, and I, after that, I, you know, I realized like wow, I really don't want to make a record unless I put that much into it. And I'd made a lot of records in the last few years with a bunch of folks out at April Bass, and I wouldn't trade them for, a world, for the world, but really definitely, after that, there was really kind of nothing. And Francis was living at April Bass for a while, and so I would just naturally just sort of be down in the box, we call it the box, where he lived for years, it's a tiny little room. Um, I would go down and kind of mess around with him or play guitar or something, but it wasn't like, I'm going to go show up, I'm going to go show up on this track, I'm going to go collab, you know, I, was, I couldn't do any of that stuff or, or make any more records, I really had to kind of chill out and get down to the grindstone, kind of. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, me again. Shatek. Um, Shatek yeah. represent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, my question is, you know, this album really kind of sets you up for something. I don't want to jinx you now. <laughs> do great, it. You Please know, do it. Coming up next, I kind of feel that kind of tension of something great coming up. You said it's, you don't want to reflect too much, but do you have any idea what you're going to do now? There's some touring, but what else after this? Yeah. A good, Please don't good. say another hi yes. No, no. No, that, that, that's actually a really good... Um, thing to say is like one of the things I'm trying to do is to not go on tour so constantly so then I'm like I'm never going on tour again ever again I'd like to just kind of liken it to just like pushing a ball down the street rather than thinking about pushing a pickup truck up a hill or going down in an avalanche you know another way to say that is just don't go on tour so much and actually plan some time with and also understand that there's other times in life where you can't just be making music songs the whole time there's other th things in life to be doing, for sure. Uh, but like we're going out and to out west to play some shows, a little smattering of shows out there, and I'm gonna just try to stay out there and try to make some music with some people that I've never got to make music with, and try to even be a little not selfish, but just like try to make the music that I'm hearing and try to work on that so I can keep my chops up too. It's like something that happens when you go on tour for a year and a half is you get back in the studio like. <laughs> that is not, yeah, that, yeah, that. It's actually kind of how easy it was to make that song. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you just, I, I want to make sure that things are balanced out. And I'd like, to, I'd like to do the band and the project a lot, but I'd like it to not ever feel like it's the only thing in my life. Because um, that would make the project better, I think. So hopefully that doesn't happen again. Thanks, Tom. We actually, you know, our first shows we played as a band um, after a bunch of years were, were in Asia because we didn't get to go over to any of those spots at the end of the last touring cycle. We, we could have figured it out, but we, that was absolutely at the end of my rope and the whole thing had run its course, I think. Um, and uh, for me anyways. But yeah, the plan is definitely to go everywhere always for the rest of the time. Speaking, speaking of, well, that just reminded me of a little funny story that I thought I would share. Uh, completely unrelated, but it, was, it reminded myself of something. 
uh, I was talking to Bruce Hornsby backstage at Eau Claire, and his son was just drafted by the Dallas Mavericks, an NBA basketball team, uh, Keith Hornsby, and, and, uh, and Bruce is a very big basketball fan, very proud of his son. And Bruce, <laughs> Bruce brought me back there and played me like a three-minute voicemail uh, from Bill Walton. Uh, Bill Walton is a uh, notable deadhead and uh, NBA Hall of Famer basketball player and very recognizable voice. And he's telling this, he's just leaving a voicemail and Bruce is playing it to me. You know, Bruce's like, check this out, man. It's like, Bruce warns me and he goes on and on and has all these amazing things to say. I'm going to see Smokey Robinson. I'm the luckiest person on earth. We're the luckiest people on earth. And he ends the voicemail and I just want to try to remember this and put it out into the, the ether that he ended the voicemail with, Bruce, everything good forever. <laughs> Goodbye, you know? <laughs> I just thought that was a good thing to share. <laughs> uh, hey, it's Carmel again from hey, the UFUV in New York. Thank you. Um, two questions. One is your favorite uh, part of the album, your favorite mm -hmm. song on the album. And, uh, and the second was sort of a follow-up question to what you were talking about before, um, just how you may have learned, or what you may have learned about finding balance, like what can keep you grounded? I know the, I know the first part pretty easily. Um, the 45 song with Lewis, that's my favorite. Why? Um, because it's Lewis, I don't, I don't know. We made an instrument and, and when I mean we, I mean like Messina and even Francis helped make this instrument and everyone before that, Roger Troutman that did the first, the most amazing vocoding in the world, we all made an instrument together. And then me and Lewis made an instrument, well the instrument we were, we, we were playing, excuse me, we didn't make it, just the two of us, was only possible to play as two people. And uh, it was just us ma just making music as freely as humanly possible. And uh, I don't know necessarily, it was at that point when I made that recording, I think we probably had like 100, 120 recordings like that were just like recordings of us making a bunch of music. And I played it for my friend Brad Cook. Um, and he was just like, just put that out. That is the best song you've ever made, you know? Um, and, and I don't know if I would have realized that if it wasn't for Brad, but it's definitely my favorite. Um, ways to stay grounded, one way is to not uh, say yes when people ask to take pictures. Feels really good to say, no thank you, not today. Um, I wish I was, didn't have to do that. I wish I was, I wish I was, I feel like I'm more of like a person that's uh, uh, willing or, you know, uh, thankful, because I am those things, but it's tough. I, that, one's, that one's weird. Um, I don't do well. It's like I do well most of the time, except for in times like that, and I don't know exactly why. Um, but just staying out of harm's way. And there's a lot of bad things that you can think about yourself, and there's a lot of bad patterns that you can get in. And, uh, you know, the, my best friends told me when I was having trouble making this record, it's like, you just gotta figure out what you want to do. And it's so easy to say, you gotta figure it out, but it takes time. And you actually have to sit down and like ponder and think and have a moment of like, I actually have to like, schedule time to think about what makes me happy and what, 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 what are the reasons that we're here or something, you know. I think we'll take just a few more. So if anyone hasn't had a chance to ask, uh, now's the time. And then after that, we'll play the album for anyone. Who this is here. really good, Nate, thank you. You gave me a coffee drink before and if I would have had any of that, I would have had a heart attack. Don't take coffee, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Nathan came up to my dad's hunting land this uh, last winter, and my dad has 400 maple trees tapped up north, and me and Nate clogged around with my little niece and nephew getting uh, you know, maple sugar for maple sap to make all sorts of wonderful drinks like this. Pretty fun. Just telling you about my life. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for.
Hey, Justin. Yeah. I was just going through some of the, uh, the sample credits in the back, mm. and it's pretty diverse. You know, I remember uh, seeing a couple days ago the headline that uh, Paolo Nantini is sampling the songs, and, and I'm just curious, I guess it's just partially because it's a part of your listening palette, but where did you find all these songs? And, and more so than that, what made you want to take these elements, these musical elements, especially of voices, it seems, and mix them into your own voice? Thank you for asking that. Uh, I think it's, it's important to remember that music, you know, when like hip hops first started happening and people were using samples and stuff, people were like, that's not your music. <laughs> or like, uh, you gotta make new, you have to make a new same chords on the electric guitar. You can't, <laughs> you can't like put other shit in there. What are these, these aren't your drums. You didn't play that. Uh, so first of all, there's like an awesome thing about sampling that I've always wanted to be able to get more into because I think that it's, might as well, if a piece of music sounds good and you want to use it in a new way, that's absolutely 100% legal. Um, but, you know, like with the Paolo Nottini thing, um, this, about, this, this song, 33, is about a very kind of messy night in London, and I met this guy, Paolo Nottini, I was like, who is this guy? I didn't know who he was, and I just heard um, from my friends that he was just like a really pretty good soul singer, you know? And uh, so a few days later, after this kind of very important happening happened in this, this night, this messy night in London, uh, I was I was just sitting uh, on a, in a hotel room in Spain when Volcano Choir was playing over at Primavera, and I just heard that fine God and religion, and I just I kind of heard it amongst the lyrics of the song that I was already working on and for that, and uh, I was like, great. More samples, you know. I was like, "Yeah, I'm doing it," you know. Um, but there's, I just, I enjoy, you know, with the OP1 again, that piece of technology. It's really easy to just throw a song in there, or like, I think at the very beginning, uh, there's some people from Chippewa uh, out here tonight. The very beginning of this is a sample from WCFW, the greatest radio station ever, where FM means fine music. <laughs> but uh, this little part. just WCFW. I'm sure they're saying something like, it's 30 below at 4 o'clock. <laughs> uh, but that's all that little sample is, you know? It's just fun to do that. And, and uh, I think the you know, last thing I'll talk about with the samples is uh, in 22 over soon, there's the Mahalia Jackson sample. And uh, yeah, if there's anybody that's ever sang for all of humanity, it's probably her. Um, I couldn't have sang that. I just need. I really heard that, and I wanted that piece of music to be in there because it just made a shitload of sense to me. And uh, to hear her voice kind of bookend another yet another Michael Lewis saxophone solo just made me really. It just made me happy. How about that? Me yeah, again. Uh, talking about radio, could could you help us all the radio people here reading your track list? Sure, yeah, <laughs> great, fantastic, because we definitely made them really messy. Yeah, we want to do it right. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, the first, first track, you all ready for this? Um, the first track is 22, in parentheses, over soon. Second track is 10, in parentheses, death breast. This is great. This is, this is very uh, tactile. Tactile. This is great. This is what we're all doing our jobs here. Um, track three, which way I, I wish it would have been 33. That would have been even cooler and more Illuminati-ish. Uh, track three is 715, area code. Uh, and the parentheses, if you will, is Creeks. Track four is 33. And no parentheses, God, in quote, quotation marks. Um, number five is 29, Stratford Apartments. No, I don't think there's any parentheses on that one, maybe. Stratford Apartments. Hashtag. No, maybe hashtag. Oh, yeah, maybe because it's a, it's a number of an apartment. So, yeah, hashtag. This is like our life of Pablo situation. We're changing it as we go. Um, <laughs> Number, yeah, number 29, hashtag 29 Stratford Apartments. Uh, 
So that's the end of side A uh, for all those radio vinyl flippers out there still. Um, track six is six six six, and in parentheses upside down cross, all one word. Was that me? Dude, that's weird. Um, Crazy. Um, number seven is twenty one. Moon water. I think that's in parentheses, maybe. One word, two words, what do you guys think? One word. Cool. It says two no here, but that's just Huntley's master, I think. Um, eight, track eight is called eight, and it's in parentheses circle. Um, track nine is just 45. Almost called it 45 in parentheses, fortify. But that was just too like, see what we did here? <laughs> uh, and, then, and then track 10, and this is the one that really definitely was more confusing than it needed to be, uh, is the number a million with no commas, and then a million in uh, parentheses. We just thought it was, it was kind of cool to just use the 10 as the track 10 in iTunes and then just put the other zeros, but... Oh, maybe we get rid of the A. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. So just the number million, the num number a million. No commas. Number no commas, and the then million. in parentheses. No. Nope. Just a million. <laughs> Capital M. Okay. So how do you say that? Oh no, you don't have to say it. But no, I would just like I'll, okay. So that's the the very like uh, official version. The, this is the quick version. Twenty two over soon. Death breast. Seven one five. 33 God, 29, 666, moon water, circle, or eight, whenever you want, 45, and a million. Sure. You didn't say 10, just, just death breast. That's how I feel, man. That's how I feel today. <laughs> See what we did there? <coughs> See what we did here? Thank you guys very much. Oh, you, no, you guys, go ahead, go ahead. So it's just a follow up. Did the sequencing determine the titles or did the titles determine the sequencing? Both. <laughs> uh, there's a, and I'll, I'll actually I'll answer that a, a little bit more, but uh, there's a band, I think, out of Milwaukee, actually. Um, I used to share some practice space down in Milwaukee with some of my collections of Colonies of Bees bandmates in Volcano Choir. There's a great poster, and it, and it was, you know, like, bands put up other posters for other bands to go see the other bands, which will never happen. Uh, but it just said, do you like reggae? Do you like punk? How about both? <laughs> uh, and I almost named Death Breast both, because I like that. It's kind of like, it is like a Taoist paradigm, just that by itself. It's like, is it this or is it this? Both. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I, there actually is a song that is kind of missing from the record. It's a song we played last year at Eau Claire's. Um, it's actually some of the artwork's kind of in there, actually, still. It's a song that just didn't belong, but it, it's still very much a part of the record, actually, called 89. And I really like this song, and it's probably the very most personal tune, which didn't work on the album, because just, I just really wanted to get, we all wanted to get the, the order really right, so that when you put it on, it just could take you somewhere and wouldn't ever be boring, hopefully. Yeah. Hi, Justin. This is Emily from the Leader Telegram. Hey, Ann. How's it going? So my question for you is, obviously, talking to a lot of the kind of lesser-known musicians from our area and some of the up-and-coming bands and some students, your name gets thrown around a lot mm -hmm. as, you know, someone who inspires them or that they, you know, admire, wanted to come to Eau Claire for that reason, things like that. Uh, wondering what advice or words you'd give to maybe some up-and-coming musicians or students here. Mm. Thanks for asking, that, Emily. Um, I think... I think it's really important, I think I've said it a few times now, I think it's really important to remember that if you're trying really hard, I've, I used to ask Mike Perry that all the time. I would call him up on the phone for the last decade and a half or whatever it's been, and just like, what do I do? How do, how do you do it, man? Like, how do you do this as a job? 
Uh, he always had amazing things to say. And I think one thing that's stuck with me is that you always got to remember that like, it is just a music song and it is, it's, it is just a book of poetry or whatever it is that you're working on. And that if it's important to you, you will do it and you will do it without editing yourself too much or editing yourself a lot more than you do. And both. <laughs> Uh, and, and that it needs to be good and that you're going to probably have to work at it somewhere to make enough money to live or something till you, till maybe one day you don't do that. But maybe easy for me to say, but it, life doesn't get easier just because you do this for your job. It gets easier in a lot of ways, but, and it's, I feel very fortunate, but it's so very important to remember that your life is going on the whole time and that you can't, you can't put yourself too far down the rabbit hole because you'll lose the reason why you did it in the first place. And that goes for people that get a lot of success, especially those people. Uh, and it also goes for the people that just unfortunately won't, you know, aren't getting heard or like are misunderstood or still breaking through their own skin. And but it also, yeah, it, it has to be about love too. It has to be about, uh, it doesn't have to be a happy song or anything or whatever you're working on, but it just has to be for a good reason. And it, and it can't just be about you and your journey. Uh, but just don't stop doing it ever. Yeah, we'll take two more, maybe, and then we'll wrap. Hi, hi, it's me. Um, it's gonna be a long-winded question. Mm -hmm. But it seems like, I mean, throughout the like conversation you've been having here and the album itself, it seems like there's this kind of like undercurrent of like healing and the need for, you know, kind of healing music in the world. I mean, I, I see it in like the way you're sampling you know, people like Molly Jackson, um, you know, that other lady you spoke about earlier, whose name I'm just Bernice thinking. Johnson, right? Johnson, right, right. I'm going to check out some of her stuff. Um, and this is something that I've been wondering about a lot lately. It's just like, you know, it seems like a lot of people are making that call that we need music that's, you know, like addressing the kind of like consistent pain that a lot of people are feeling in society, like just around now. Mm -hmm. um, and I go back and forth with myself and with others, like whether or not times are more painful now than they have been in the history. And maybe it's just because technology is bringing it like right in our faces more or something like that. But I'd love to hear you how to meditate on just like, you know, the need for that now and like where we are at present and the way that your album fits in, you know, with. Well, first, first off, I, I think it's important for me not to think about how my album fits into it. Uh, maybe it fits in there, and maybe it helps somebody, um, but I shouldn't... For me, it's not helpful to think about how I'm going to directly help things. Um, it's okay, it, it feels good that, to know that maybe a, a, a small part of moving that needle a little bit, but it, I don't want to be distracted by some legacy or you know, he did a really good job in his life kind of attitude or like wanting that for yourself. Uh, I, hmm. There's a lot of pain, you know, there's a lot of bad things happening all over the place. And again, we're here we are and we're talking about music song, but I think that's very important that we are and that um, that it is just one night that we stop and talk about these music songs. And, and maybe I'll talk a little bit more and, uh, down the line um, or something, but it's just important. It, like I was talking about this place, the Oxbow Hotel, like that we're opening. It's so important to have these places to gather energy, good energy, good, you know, good community jobs and, and, and something that isn't owned by somebody that doesn't live in our town just strictly economically speaking. But it is so very, very important to think about spending time and figuring out a way to aid like the shelters in our region, like the people taking care of the people. That's, I think that's really, that's it, you know? And, and we, can, we can play guitar and we can sing and we can make beautiful films and things like that, but there's also, uh, I think the most choked up I got all year was at the SPs when those those four dudes got up, Mello and Dwayne Wade and LeBron and uh, Chris Paul I think, 
that was the most choked up I got this year because they were just like, you know, enough of this shit. We have to talk about this stuff. It has to be about love and communication. But like America is way too good of an idea to be getting shit on this hard. Um, yeah, that's how I think. Been a few who haven't asked anything. I just want to make sure everyone gets in. Done. Done here too. Yeah. Cool. So can you talk about uh, artworks? You know, their debut album. It's almost like ice and snow. We don't see anything. In the second album, we get to see a little bit of outside. It's like familiar, maybe the scenery here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the third album, it's like a lot of like uh, symbols, but are surrounded by so many things, but it looks like sent out, but it's maybe your, your spirituality or something. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like from the first album to this album, you are more a little bit outside and discovering yourself in bigger places? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, I, I think it's interesting to look at the, I mean, the album work is kind of, I've messed myself up as if I wanted to have any sort of continual artistic kind of mode, maybe, now. Um, but I think, I don't know, if I, I, I can't tell, maybe it's both again. Maybe I've gone, maybe I'm going in harder and out harder. Um, and, and, and hopefully along that process, I'm not, uh, I'm not, becoming too self-involved with going in farther. And that's why you have to push out and exhale and, and get that stuff farther away. Um, and yeah, like, I'm, I'm about to quote myself, but like on the album, on this album, I was like saying that these are just places to me now. Uh, uh, and like the last album was just about a place, places and like, it's so important. And this one's really just about people. And, and these are just places like wherever I am, the only, thing that makes it very, very beautiful, usually, are the people, you know. Um, there's not, yeah, there's not as much majesty of nature on this one. I think that more the majesty of our natures or something. Thank you. One more in the back. Hi, it's Andrea from The Current. Oh my god. Well, you're just hiding back there, dude. Sorry, I waited so long. <laughs> I'm shy. Oh, you, sc um, you scoundrel. I've been thinking a lot about uh, how gospel appears in your new work, and um, you've already talked a little bit about some of the artists that have inspired you, but I just I think it's really interesting how you've applied it to this new instrument that you're using to stack your vocals, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about discovering that and um, applying gospel influences to your work? Well, I pulled off a couple of cool chord changes in the album with the Messina. Um, but they're the only gospel chord changes that I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so it's funny you asked me that, Andrea. Maybe we can talk about this, this, this later um, more. But I really want to get a lot more chords under my belt. Um, I'm always asking Phil Cook to teach me more chords, but then we just usually end up, he usually just spaces out and forgets to teach me more chords, or I'm asking him about something else too, and then we're just hanging out or something. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think Mahalia, even though she's not strictly gospel, and like Nina Simone's chords, there's this Nina Simone and piano album uh, that's just one of my favorite recordings. and. It's just how chords move. It's very, it's like Ellington y meets, you know, New Orleans stuff and like all this chordal information that James Booker and stuff like that, that the way that chords move can make you feel so happy. Uh, whereas like folk kind of northern folk songs, it's like three chords and it's like, it's kind of happy, it's kind of just straight ahead. And uh, I just want to, I actually want to learn a lot more and get, get more of those under my belt so that I can find kind of ways to be a little more stoked about things and like shouting about it rather than like, oh, it hurts so bad, like those kind of chords. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's probably the worst answer of the night for my friend. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I, I really wanted to, you know, 
it's not just about emulating stuff either. You wanna you wanna be able to make some stuff that's new, but it just takes a while to do it without just cheating. It's like, oh, I learned these chords, now I know how to do this. You know, you have to be careful. You have, you can't just be an expert right away. Thanks. I just had one quick question. Yeah. That, um, her question made me think of. I thought one of the most um, striking moments on the record was, uh, I forget what song it was, but your it was your voice, but it wasn't um, treated. It wasn't double tracked. It wasn't falsetto. It was very sounded very natural. Mm. Was that um, a, how, how, what was the impetus of of d trying that? Because I, I don't know if I've heard that before. On uh, I guess it's probably I didn't actually think about it too much, uh, but now I'm realizing it probably is the only time that I single tracked my voice. Um, it came from a jam that me and B.J. Burton had gone a number of summers ago now already. And, uh, excuse me, and it was just him making a beat on the, the new Roland drum machine and me just playing M1. And it was one of those rare moments where the kind of the song and the melody and the chords all kind of came all at once. And so there's a recording that I always go back and study to try to figure out what the song was. It was just us messing around for 10 or 12 minutes with those chords. And he had a particular vocal effect, which is just a short slap back echo on my voice. And when I was singing it, it just sounded, and we had the speakers really loud. It wasn't like us like trying to record a nice sound. It was just like loud as shit coming back at us. And the sound of my voice coming back through the speakers had this little echo on it. And it just made me sing it a certain way, like the sonic of it. And uh, I just basically spent the last couple of years chasing that song down to match it to that moment. And I just could never, Later on in the song, the vocals sort of start multiplying, and, and there's, you hear some Mikey noise in there and stuff. But it, yeah, I think for those verses, I just needed to be not hiding from anybody by double tracking my voice or something. Like, I don't know. Um, I just, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of repeat what I said in the, the little note to you guys that uh, I was really nervous about this, and I'm really, really just touched. I knew the people that decided to come here would understand that what we were trying to do and I just really appreciate it like really deeply that that you'd come and want to talk about our band uh, and what we're trying to do. Um, that's enough. That's enough for me. That is all I, I need or want uh, about talk, you know, you know, it's just nice that you're doing it and I just really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys very much. Thank you.